Good morning, church. Good morning. And welcome and thank you for 
Verley and Kara and our choir for getting us ready for worship this morning. Love that call to worship. Let's forget about ourselves and magnify his name. I love what John the Baptist said as Jesus approached, I must become less so that he must become greater. Remember that great definition of humility by C.S. Lewis? C.S. Lewis is not thinking less of ourselves. It is thinking of ourselves less. And that's part of what this time of worship is all about. Thinking about ourselves less and thinking about him more as we magnify him in worship this morning. It is wonderful to see you all this morning, all your smiling eyes this morning. Yeah, I think of that, that, that great old song, when Irish eyes are smiling. I can see all of your eyes smiling this morning. It is wonderful uh, to see you. The announcements were scrolling uh, before the service. I've just got a couple of things that I want to lift up to you this morning. And can I just say right off the bat, I can see that this third row on the left has the potential to be trouble. I want you to know I'm yes. keeping my eye yeah. on, on all of it. Starting with trouble. Right here. Yes. So, George, would you come up here, please, first of all? Uh, we have an exciting announcement about our adult Sunday school. So, George, tell us tell us about that. Well, good. Yeah, we're on. Good morning, everybody. Um, our adult Sunday school class, who has not been meeting for several weeks now, we are going to begin again. And we meet in the chapel, which is just behind the sanctuary here at 11 o'clock right after this service. Many of you have been attending our class. Some of our, some of our winter snowbirds have been back and, and haven't been in class because we were not meeting. But Sally Jett, Sally, where are you? Stand up. Sally Jett and I co-lead our class. And so we're going to begin again on the 14th, two weeks from today at 11 o'clock. The study material that we have already for the winter season, we're going to finish that up and we'll have the new books for, for March. I'm going to finish leading the class for the last two weeks in February and Sally's going to begin in March. So you're all welcome. We kind of spread ourselves out there and there. And so uh, come on down. All right. Thank you, George. And if they all come, you'll just have to stay in here, right? That's right, we will. Yeah. You'll just have to stay in here. Okay. Um, it is, uh, it, I am so excited. I tell you, today is the culmination of six and a half years of persistent prayer. And many of you have already met our new assistant pastor, uh, Pastor Rich Stortz. But for those of you who haven't, uh, this past week, or perhaps it was the week before, he was officially hired by our guide team, and I want to introduce him to you this morning. I want to ask uh, Pastor Rich and his lovely wife, uh, Yvonne, if they would come forward. Would you, would you just welcome them? <laughs> Rich, would you just uh, tell, tell your new church family a little bit about yourself and Yvonne, and so they can start to get to know you. Love to. Uh, well, welcome, New Church family. You guys have made us feel loved and welcome. Thank you so very much. Um, this is Yvonne, my wife. My, I'm the luckiest man in the world. We've been married a little over a year and a half. Uh, we were ministry partners in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and Papano Beach, Florida, at a, uh, a larger church called Christ Church. Uh, she actually started Blessings Food Pantry. I started the Share Meal Program. They blended together. Uh, we did all the missional outreach for Christ Church. Uh, we were partners in ministry for over eight years, and uh, now we're partners in life. Amen? Amen. Um, I was just recently hired full-time. Thank you so very much um, to be your uh, state assistant pastor and to do missional outreach. Um, right now, we're working on things like dinner church. Um, we're putting together a pub church where we're actually going to take worship to Sheila's pub and do a, uh, put together a little band, and we're going to do uh, prayers, pool, and parables. So... Um, it's a fresh reflect expression. Um, if you, you're familiar with Methodism, um, that's something we've been working on as a conference for the last five years or so. And that is bringing Jesus outside the four walls, feeding people where they're at, instead of trying to drag them in our four walls. I will also um, uh, assist Pastor David here. Uh, I will preach once a month. 
Please come. I'm not telling you. <laughs> so when they say Pastor Rich is preaching, I want to come in and see five people. Um, uh, but no, thank you for having us. Uh, thank you for making us part of a new adventure. Uh, something I learned uh, about a year and a half ago is every day is a new day and a new adventure with Jesus. And um, just thank you for having us be part of yours. Thank you. And I just can't wait for all of you. Yeah, you give, give them a round of applause. I can't wait for you guys to, to really get to know uh, Rich and Yvonne. They are just such delightful people with an incredible, incredible testimony and boundless energy. And uh, I'm so excited. The only concern I have uh, the, the whole, is about the whole pub church thing. I was a little afraid that once you found out, there might be more Methodists than regulars in the pub <laughs> that night. So do leave, do leave a little room for the regulars. Uh, we need to, we absolutely need to reach them with, uh, with the love of Jesus. So Rich, would you just open us with prayer this morning? Dear Heavenly Father, as we come today humbly to worship you, to present ourselves as a gift to you, open up ears and hearts and minds this morning um, that we may grow with you, that we may experience the presence of the Spirit, uh, the power of the Father, and the salvation of Jesus Christ as a family, as a church family. Uh, we lift up all those that can't be here today, they're on our Facebook. Um, please uh, give them strength and give them courage. Uh, a special note for all those people that read lips. Um, in this day and age, how fearful it must be for them to walk the street or to do any business whatsoever when everybody has a mask on. Um, to all those people that are on the margins, uh, we, we pray that your presence will be felt by them today. In Jesus' holy name, amen. 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 Thank you. Would you welcome them one more time, please? Thank you. Now, if you would, please stand and join me as we sing our opening hymn this morning, To God Be the Glory. <laughs>
Let's praise the Lord now as we affirm our faith together using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born in the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sit at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I remind you that although we can no longer pass collection plates, that giving is still such an important part of our worship. Part of what it means to be created in the image of God is that we are wired to give. We can never, however, outgive God. But we do thank you for your ongoing generosity and for all of the many ways that you give and support the ministries of this church that change lives both here in our very own community and around the world. And I'll say a bit more about that a little bit later on in the service. But right now, Father, we thank you for all the gifts that will come in this week, whether they are dropped into the collection boxes, they are dropped in the mail, or folks give online. However they choose to give, Lord, we pray that you would bless each and every gift, both great and small. Bless it and multiply it for your glory and for the building of your kingdom here on earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And now, friends, that you are all seated, please buckle your seatbelts and hang on. <laughs> Thank you. 
this morning when he, said, when he woke up. That was good stuff. You want to do it again next week? Why not? Yeah, one more time. You want to do it one more time now? Yeah. Yeah, let's do it again. You ready? Yeah, sure. Yes, you want to. Uh, Aren't you glad we worship the God of second chances? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Now, before, before you sing it again, you mentioned Joe. Who else? Anybody else? It made, it made me think of it's something that Theo just texted me about Moses and King Ramses. Moses says, Ramses, I'm sorry, but I've got to diagnose you with Letma. And Ramses says, Letma, what's Letma? Let my people go. <laughs> All right. I, I don't know why that song just made me made me think of that. You want to do it again? Sure. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> A little closer to the mic. A little closer to the mic. If I do that, yeah. People can turn it off. Turn it off. Let's try this again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
in Tanzania. I told you that uh, through the generosity of a member of our church family, we had purchased uh, six acres of land within the Serengeti National Reserve. Uh, I think I probably shared with you, uh, maybe I didn't, uh, someone that afternoon who was watching online uh, emailed me and said, uh, uh, Pastor, please call me. I'd like to discuss the temporary structure that will be going up on, on the land, the temporary church. And uh, she gave the money uh, that was needed to build that temporary structure. Yeah. Well, by Friday, uh, our friend uh, Fernando, our, our mission partner Fernando, who's probably watching this service uh, online right now from Tanzania, he said, he texted, he messaged me, he said, Oh, Pastor, I am confused by the speed of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I thought you ain't the only one. <laughs> he says, he says, I left the I left the site in the Serengeti and I to visit Allison's House of Hope, which is almost complete. The, the children's desks are complete, and one of our classrooms is finished and ready to receive children. He says, I went back to the site in the Serengeti. And they were all digging the foundations for the permanent building. So, um, so anyway, uh, someone else in the congregation uh, wanted to come and see me and wanted to give $5,000 towards the work in the Serengeti. And I said to them, I said, well, we've already paid for the, this was early in the week, we've already paid for the temporary structure. I'm not sure what we'll use this $5,000 for, but I'm sure it will go to good use. Well, after we sent them the uh, $2,200 uh, for the temporary structure that will now be used for the foundation, uh, guess how much they need to finish the foundation? $5,000. Thank you, Jesus. 
Yes. yes. So I am, I, you know, I, sometimes I am initially confused by the speed of the Holy Spirit, but within a couple of days, oh, so that's what you're doing. So uh, here's a brief little video. The, the, the footage is quite raw. We tried to fancy it up just a little bit for you, but go ahead and show that video. And uh, uh, here we are. Uh, so it turns out that uh, that uh, we, we now have a United Methodist men's group there in the Serengeti. And uh, Fernando said to me, so the president of the United Methodist men uh, is an engineer. So he is overseeing all the work and uh, the members of our new church are, are all donating their work there. And you can see that everyone is involved. I said, Fernando, I said, you just preached there a couple of days ago, and you're telling me you've got a Methodist men's group? <laughs> and you've got a president? <laughs> yes. So, uh, so so, there you go. That's uh, that's what I did not include. They subsequently, they sent me uh, another uh, very short video clip of, of a dump truck uh, pulling up to the site and tipping out uh, loads and loads of sand, which they will use to fabricate the bricks uh, themselves. So... <laughs> Who knows what's going to happen by next Sunday? You know, I mean, isn't that the great thing? You know, it's like, gosh, I can't wait to get to church next Sunday to see what's happening, to see what God is hey, doing. Hey, yes, ma'am. They are winning today. They are absolutely winning today. Thank you for that perfect segue, uh, Lori. <laughs> so let me begin by telling you about Bob Specka, who was a sophomore at Marple Newton High School when he was first introduced to the math induction theory. Do we have any uh, math students or math former math teachers here this morning? Perhaps you've heard of the math induction theory. His teacher, Mr. Dobrensky, likened that theory to the domino effect. And now everyone's like, oh, oh, now I, now I know. Yeah, this is, this is where we're going, right? So after school, Bob Specko went home, or he actually went out and bought two boxes of dominoes. He lined up 112 dominoes in a row, and he pushed one over, and you all know exactly what happened. It had the, the domino effect. Now, after graduating high school, Bob Specka appeared on the Johnny Carson show to show off his domino toppling skills. The Guinness Book of World Records actually created a category to recognize his accomplishments. And in 1976, Bob Specka set the first world record in domino toppling with a chain reaction numbering 11,111 dominoes. Over the next decade, he would break his own record five times, and he would eventually top out at 97,500 dominoes. Now, around the same time that Bob was setting the world record, a physicist by the name of Lauren Whitehead was doing experiments on the domino chain reaction. What she discovered is that a domino was capable of knocking over another domino one and a half times its size. And so this little two inch domino can knock over a three inch domino. And that can topple a four and a half inch domino ad infinitum. By the time, wait for this. <laughs> By the time you get to the 18th domino, it could topple over the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Of course, it's already leaning, so that's not entirely fair. But the 21st domino could take down the Washington Monument. The 23rd domino could knock over the Eiffel Tower, and the 27th domino could cartwheel the 160-story Burj Khalifa. Let me, go, let me go back to all the way to the first time uh, someone thought of this idea, or at least the principle behind this idea. It goes all the way back to the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11, verse 6, where it says, nothing they set out to do will be impossible to them. Let me say that another way. Almost anyone can accomplish almost anything 
if they work at it long enough, hard enough, and smart enough. And I would suggest to you that I would call that domino habits. This idea that little habits have big long-term effects. Little habits can have high leverage impact. Here's what I know for sure. If you do little things like they are big things, God will do big things as if they are little things. And so we continue our series on Mark Patterson's book, Win the Day. We talked about two habits that will help you bury dead yesterdays and let go of unborn tomorrows. You have to flip the script and kiss the wave. Now this morning I want to talk about the third habit, eat the frog. And one of the things I love about Batterson's book is that each, each one of these habits has a really weird, quirky name. Flip the script, kiss the wave, and you think to yourself, what on earth does that mean? Where did that come from? And he explains it, and then of course it makes perfect sense. He calls the third habit, eat the frog, because Mark Twain is purported to have said, if you ever have to eat a live frog, it's best done first thing in the morning. <laughs> now, why is that? Why is that? Because you can go through the rest of your day knowing that the hardest thing is behind you. <laughs> According to a study done by Duke University, 45% of our behavior is automatic. 45%. Now that's not bad, unless of course they are bad habits. Habits are the way that we put things on repeat. Without that, our ability, without our ability to automate, we would have to relearn everything every single day. And so habitualization is not just a good thing, it's actually a God thing. Habits save us tremendous time and energy, but that savings comes at a cost. Because when something becomes second nature, we don't really give it a second thought. And that's when and where and why we need to begin to deconstruct our habits and then to reconstruct those daily habits. In other words, take them apart piece by piece and put them back together again. Here's what I believe. You can reinvent yourself. You can reprogram your mind. You can repurpose your emotions. Almost anyone can do anything if you work at it long enough, hard enough, and smart enough. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Pastor David, you're becoming some kind of self-help viewer. <laughs> now, I want to suggest to you that this is a stewardship issue. It is making the most of the time, the talent, and the treasure that God has entrusted to us. My utmost for his highest. It's not just cultivating good habits, it's cultivating God habits. Wesley would call this going on to perfection. On the 17th of May, 2014, Admiral William H. McRaven delivered the commencement address at his alma mater, the University of Texas at Austin. And his advice to those Longhorns, if you want to change the world, Start off by making your bed. Now that doesn't seem like life-changing advice, but daily habits yield compound interest over time. Start your day by making your bed is similar to William Osler's advice of living in daytight compartments. Admiral McRaven's military career ended when he was the ninth commander of the United States Special Operations Command. But much of his 37-year career was spent as a Navy SEAL officer. McRaven turned his speech into a New York Times bestseller sharing lessons that Navy SEAL training had taught him about life. And the first lesson, start your day with a completed task. 
task. And the most completed task with which to start your day, in my opinion, it is spending time with God. The great German reformer Martin Luther said, I have so much to do today that I must spend the first three hours in prayer. John Wesley rose every morning at four or five and spent the first two hours of the day in prayer and scripture reading. And if you've ever been to Wesley's house in London, you can kneel and pray in that closet next to his bedroom known as the powerhouse of the Methodist revival. Batterson quotes uh, a, a book called Lessons from the Life of Moody, which of course I had to go on Amazon right away in order, as being formational in the most important part of his routine. There is a passage which goes like this, every day of his life, meaning D.L. Moody, I have reason for believing he arose very early in the morning to study the word of God way down to the close of his life. Mr. Moody used to rise at about four o'clock in the morning to study his Bible. He would say to me, if I am going to get in any study, I have to get up before the other folks get up. And he would shut himself up in a remote room in his house, alone with God and his Bible. Now, up until reading this book, I thought I was doing pretty good. Dragging myself out of bed at 620, helping get the kids ready for school, getting Lily to school over here across the street at 8 a.m., and then spending a little bit of time in our 24-7 prayer room. Of course, that was only Mondays through Fridays, and then I'd have to miss on Tuesdays for the men's breakfast and Bible study, which starts at 8 o'clock. Can I make a confession? I'm not a morning person. <laughs> Anyone else? Anybody else? Praise the Lord. For that matter, I'm not much of a late night person either. You know, catch me for a few hours in the middle of the day, you know, and I'm all right. But Batterson has a section in chapter 5 called Attack the Day. And I realized something when I read that. I had been allowing the day to attack me. Every morning when that alarm went off at 6.15, I felt like somebody was punching me in the face. I felt, you know, so, so I just decided that if I was going to eat the frog and make my first completed task, my time with God, I was going to have to go on the offensive and attack the day. And so I programmed my coffee maker to come on at 5, 10 a.m. Believe it or not, I have never programmed a coffee maker before. <laughs> That's because I was allowing the day to attack me instead of attacking the day. I set my coffee maker to start at 5, 10 a.m., and I set my alarm for 5, 15, and now I literally wake up and smell the coffee. <laughs> And by 5.20, I am in my chair spending the first part of my day with God. Using the Lectio 365 app in the Bible in one year, Express. I started the day before we began this message series together and on January, 6, on January 16th. And today, I am up to day 16 and I haven't missed a day. Now, I looked up online. How long does it take to form a habit? How long does it take to habitualize? Now, several websites said 21 days. That's not too bad. However, Healthline.com said, according to a 2009 study published in the European Journal of Social Psychology, it takes between 18 and 254 days for a person to form a new habit. The study also concluded on average that it takes 66 days for a behavior to become automatic. So please, I invite you, I encourage you to ask me how things are going with that. <laughs> What'd you say? <laughs> oh, they're going well so far. <laughs> I haven't missed a day yet. Ask me, ask me next week. Right? 50 days. 50 days from now. 50 days. 
Don't wait that long. Ask me next week. Are there any other churches where the sermon's interacting? You know, David, on YouVersion, it does tell you how many days you've done it in a row. Okay. It streaks, and then they give you little badges okay. if you do it like... So, there's a little carrot Would you like the microphone? <laughs> 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 this, this servant's rapidly evolving from, from a servant to stand up here. Uh, no, but do ask me next week, please. There are countless things that happen every day that I have no control over, like this sermon. <laughs> like the dog leaving a good morning gift next to the bed. The kid's hair doesn't cooperate with the comb. Traffic, traffic on 27 sets the whole tone for your day in a bad way. You know, some days just start off wrong. And no matter how hard you try, you just can't see the course correct. But this book has helped me to realize that even on those days that spin out of control, like today, I am still response able. Think about that. Doesn't matter what happens. Doesn't matter how, how much life may spin out of control. I am still response able. Now, that doesn't mean that I find my new routine easy. Some of you are morning people. You know, it's easy for you. Four o'clock, your eyes pop open, you're wide awake. It's hard. But Batterson shares two principles that will help. And the first is called habit switching. And the second is called habit stacking. And both of these have become game changers for me. So let me talk about these two techniques, habit switching and habit stacking, both of which help you to eat the frog. Now, in the Gospels, in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus, Jesus says something that I find fascinating as it relates to habit formation. It's in Matthew chapter 12. Matthew 12, beginning with the 43rd verse. This is what he says. He says, when an impure spirit comes out of someone, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. And when it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean, and put in order. And then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse. Worse than the first. Now I'll be honest, that's somewhat of a complicated verse to understand, but let me ask the obvious question, why? Why is that person worse off? Because they didn't cultivate the disciplines necessary to back up the divine deliverance. God can deliver you in a day, no doubt, but you have to cultivate the daily habits to back up that miracle. We talked about it when we talked about kissing the wave. If you want God to do the super, you've got to do what? Exactly. The natural. We can't just pray like it depends on God. You have to work like it depends on you. Hold that thought. You don't break a bad habit by not doing it. Oh, sure, that might work for a week or two or four, but it's not a long-term solution. Spiritually speaking, you don't stop sinning by not sinning. That's like someone saying to you, don't think about the Jolly Green Giant. Okay, what just went through your mind? I know exactly what did. In psychology, there's something called a double blind. I say to you, be spontaneous. And you can't. You can't do it. It creates a no-win situation. And I believe the same goes for every temptation that we face, every addiction that we're trying to break. I wish that eating the frog was as simple as just say no. But it's not. 
The solution is you need a vision that is bigger and better than the temptation that you face. The best way to break a bad habit is establishing a good habit. And that's easier said than done, isn't it? It takes time and effort. You've got to reinvest time and talent and treasure into a good habit, into a God habit. Now, in the 1970s, Dr. William Glasser wrote a groundbreaking book called Positive Addiction. He said, addiction is not all bad. Sure, of course, negative addictions will destroy lives. One drink, one click, one hit at a time. But positive addictions have the opposite effect. And in a sense, all of us are addicts. The question is, are those addictions positive or negative? Are they healthy or unhealthy? Are they holy or unholy? Let me give you an example. All of us, I'll raise both hands, all of us can afford to complain a little less. I rode to church this morning with Allison. And it's hard. <laughs> it's not because she's a terrible driver. It's just, I like to be in the driver's seat. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm getting a silent amen over there. That's you. Yeah. It's hard. But I didn't complain about her driving. We got almost here. We were right there in the Presbyterian Church. And this truck in front of us decides to turn right. <laughs> Can you possibly go any slower? She let me have it. I'm the, between there and church, I had a mini sermon right there. <laughs> but you don't just stop complaining. You've got to have it switch. Let me give you a simple example. If you want to flip the script, one of the best things you can do, and this is something we talked about last week, and this is something I've... I am complaining less. And I think that part of the key to that is keeping a gratitude journal. It can turn someone who has the ability to complain about everything into a person who is grateful for everything with one little habit. Keep a gratitude journal every day. Write down one genuine gratitude and then rehearse it and recite it every single day. And sooner or later, you will flip the script. Why? Because it sanctifies the reticular activating system. It is that part of the brain that is responsible for what gets noticed and what goes unnoticed. You aren't a complainer anymore. And now you're someone who is actually profoundly grateful for everything and anything in life, but you have to have it switch. So I'm on that journey too, so feel free to ask me about that too. <laughs> The second key is habit stacking. Habit stacking is a technical term that re refers to combining a habit that comes easy, like drinking coffee, with a habit that requires a little more discipline, like getting up at 5.15 in the morning. Right? Don't you wish that good habits came as easily as bad habits? But they don't, which is why habit stacking has been a game changer for me piggybacking harder habits on the ones that come naturally, like coffee. And when I start sipping my coffee, I start reading my Bible, and by the time I'm done with that cup of coffee, I have caffeinated my soul, and it makes both habits more enjoyable. Now, the nomenclature of habit stacking might be new, but the idea is as old as the Shema. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might. Keep these words that I'm commanding you today in your heart. Well, how do you keep them in your heart? How do you put them into practice? Well, the answer is habit stacking. Listen to this, verse 7. Recite them to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're away, when you lie down and when you rise up. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your emblem on your forehead. And oh, oh, write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. God doesn't just give us commands. He couples them with daily rituals. Getting up and going to bed 
And so if you're trying to cultivate a prayer habit, for example, one of the best ways to do it is first thing in the morning or last thing at night. Why? Because those rituals function as reminders. Well, friends, here's some good news. You are all already habit stacking. What do I mean? Well, you aren't even aware of it, but I hope you all pray before meals or you hug your spouse when you get home. You see, you're already habit stacking. The trick is to put this into practice across the board. So pick a habit, any habit. You've got to stack those really hard habits with rituals and routines that come naturally. Still feel like you can't find time? Me neither. And so you've got to make time. Eating the frog isn't easy. It's choosing the important over the urgent. And oh, Lord, when I stop and think about how much of my life is responding to the urgent, but it's not necessarily the important. It's figuring out your high leverage habits and then investing your time in them, your talent in them. It's recognizing your unique gift to the world and utilizing it. It's recognizing that time can only be spent once. And so you must spend it wisely. All right, let me try to land this. I'd been done five minutes ago. <laughs> Love it. Mind if somebody's listening. Thank you. Thank you. Show me your habits, and I will show you your future. Over time, we all become the sum total of our habits. Now that might sound a little overwhelming, but let's break it down. Can you do it for a day? Don't try to change 17 things all at one time because you will fail on day one. Focus on one habit or maybe two habits if you're habit stacking, but for better or worse, good habits always come back to bless us and bad habits always come back to bite us. You know where. Jesus says in Matthew 7, 2, with the measure you use, it will be measured unto you. In other words, you get out of it what you put into it. And by that, I mean anything and everything from your health to your wealth to your marriage. How you do anything is ultimately how you will do everything. Now, I don't want to over-spiritualize this or under-spiritualize habit formation. There is definitely a psychology to habit formation, but there is also a theology to habit formation. It is an art and it is also a science, but it is also a spiritual battle that is won or lost in the heart and in the mind. Solomon says, as a man thinketh in his mind, so he is. It starts up here and it starts here. The good news is almost anybody can accomplish almost anything if they work hard at it, long enough, hard enough, and smart enough. Yes, you. But it starts, it starts with a little two-inch domino. Domino habits. That's how it starts. That's why each one of you was giving, given a, a domino when you came in this morning. Stick it in your pocket. Set it on the table next to your Bible or wherever you do your devotions as a daily reminder. You've got to fill out that application. You've got to make that first appointment, check that first box, do that first workout, lose that first pound. You flick that first domino and some good news all the way back to the math induction theory. It takes very little effort to push over that first domino. Only 0.24 joules of input energy to be exact. The flick of a finger. And by the time you get to the 13th domino, the potential energy is 2 billion times greater than the energy it took over to knock over that first domino. My point, I love Zechariah 4.10. Do not despise these small beginnings. We overestimate what we can accomplish in a year or two, and we underestimate what God can do in 10 or 20. Friends, the compound interest of daily habits makes the difference. They pay dividends until the day you die. In fact, they pay dividends beyond that. Give it enough time. 
You can transform your body. You can transform your mind. You can transform your marriage. You can transform your finances. You can transform your attitude. You can help to transform your church, your community, and the world. It all comes down to one question. Can you do it for a day? When it comes to habit formation, that is the question. So pick a habit, any habit, and with a flick of a finger, knock over that first domino. Do a little habit switching, a little habit stacking, and the cumulative effect of those daily habits will pay dividends until the day you die. It will leave an inheritance for all eternity. Yesterday is history. Tomorrow is mystery. Eat the frog. <laughs> Father, we thank you for this time today. We thank you for your word to us. Lord, many of us sort of have this nagging feeling deep down inside. A feeling of dissatisfaction with ourselves, with life. We want to be better. We want to be more. We want to have more of an impact on our family and the people around us and the world. Lord, remind us that even though there are a lot of things in life that happen to us that are beyond our control, that ultimately each and every one of us is responsible for the things that happen to us in life. So Lord, I pray that we wouldn't just float along, that we wouldn't just drift along in life. But today we would begin to be more intentional. Remind us that time can only be spent once. That it is a precious gift. Help us to spend that time wisely. Help us to spend that time with you. Help us to spend that time being the hands and feet of Jesus to the folks around us. Lord, if it was easy, everybody would do it. And, and this wouldn't be earth. This would be paradise. This would be heaven. But it doesn't work that way. Forming good habits, forming godly habits is hard. It's difficult. Jesus said the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So Lord, strengthen our arms today and help us to form those godly habits that will enable us to be the people that you have created us and called us to be. Lord, we thank you for this time. Send us out of this place a little bit different, a little bit more like Jesus because we were here today. And we give you all the praise and the honor and the glory. And it's in his name that we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's stand up and sing our last hymn this morning. Take the name of Jesus with you. <laughs>
hope that you'll take the name of Jesus with you. And now let's bless one another with the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.